Let us pray. Eternal God, in the reading of the scripture, may your word be heard. In the meditations of our hearts, may your word be known. And in the faithfulness of our lives, may your word be shown. Amen. The image that we start with today is a defiant Job who last week shook his fist at the Almighty and asked why. How could you do all of this to me? And we talked about that being a very faithful response. Honest questions, raw emotions, bringing that before God and seeking an answer. And questions that we've all had at some time or another, in particular in the midst of pain, in the midst of suffering, that just seems to be too much to bear. And the response in the book of Job, and if you're reading Job for all the answers about suffering, uh, you're not going to get many because it is a continuation of talking about the mystery of the divine and the mystery of the sacred in our midst and how those are intertwined and that suffering and pain and joy and all of that parts of life are all connected. And yet, it's so hard to see those connections. But the response is surprising. Instead of answering, it seems that God's a little annoyed. Were you there? Were you there when I laid the foundations of the earth? How dare you question me? And in the lectionary reading, the last three verses that Conlon read to you are omitted. And it's unfortunate that they are, because they catch some of the, not just a, a feminine side of the creator, but playfulness. Listen again to those verses. And who took charge of the ocean when it gushed forth like a baby from the womb? That was me. I wrapped it in soft clouds and tucked it safely at night. Then I made a playpen for it, a strong playpen so it couldn't run loose, and said, stay there in your place. Your wild tantrums are confined to this place. <coughs> William Sloan Coffin, in his book, Letters to a Young Doubter, uh, writes about an experience he had when he was an undergraduate at Yale. Three of his friends were killed in a car accident when the driver fell asleep at the wheel. And at the funeral, Coffin was sickened by the piety of the priest as he spoke the words from Job. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Coffin was so outraged that he even considered tripping the priest as he processed up the aisle of the church. And as he was preparing to do so, a small voice asked him, what part of the phrase, Coffin, are you objecting to? He says that he thought about it, and he thought it was the second part, that the Lord hath taken away. Then suddenly, he writes, it dawned on me that I was protesting the first. The Lord gave. It hit me hard that it was not my world, that at the best we we're just guests. And the Lord gave was a statement against which all spheres of human pride have to be hurled and shattered. You know, I thought about 
this particular passage from Job quite a bit this week. And in the particular context of suffering and pain and just how we try to understand it. And then we move to Mark's Gospel, this very interesting story that happens after the third prediction of the Passion. And Jesus has resolutely turned his face towards Jerusalem and has tried to help the disciples understand. And so the sons of thunder, it's amazing the nicknames that are picked up in the Bible, the sons of thunder come with their request. Can we sit at the right and at the left? Now, the other Gospels, and this happens in three of the Gospels, so it is an event that is almost certain to, to have happened in history. And the other Gospels... Uh, change it slightly. And so they're uncomfortable with the story. Matthew, it's not James and John who come, but their mother who comes on their behalf and asks for them to sit at the right and the left. And Luke uh, simply has one sentence about it. There was a dispute about who was the greatest. So they're trying to figure out what do we do with this story? How do we figure out our identity as we're living into the realm of heaven? According to Matthew's God, the realm, the kingdom of God, that, that realm that is here now, that is unfolding before us in our living. And as we, as we embody and as we incarnate the compassion of God and we bring that kingdom even closer. And we continue to do it. 2,000 years later, we are trying to live into that realm, into that kingdom. But the context is the journey to Jerusalem and to the cross. Now, before we get too upset with James and John, we also need to remember is that the similar story is told about Martha and Mary. Remember Martha and Mary? One's in the kitchen and one's listening to Jesus. And Martha comes and says, you know, tell Mary to come and help. The same type of conversation. Who has a chance to be part of this kingdom? part of this reign. And the story from last week was about the, about the rich young man who cannot be part of it because he can't give up what Jesus is asking him. And remember I said he was set up? Jesus set him up because he had the wrong attitude about the question. What must I do to get there? Well, the whole gospel's not about what you do or how you earn it. It's about responding to that grace, that powerful grace. In his book, The Life Teachings and Relevance of, of a Religious Revolutionary, the late Marcus Borg talks about four characteristics of, that may help us with this story. And he talks about power as it's exercised in the world in which Jesus found himself giving leadership. And says, first, in this particular society, it was a class-based society in which an urban ruling elite of no more than 2% of the population held all the power, wealth, and status, while as many as 90% of the population were rural-based peasant class of agricultural workers, fishers and artisans. There was also a small retainer class of officials who were to be found in the military, the upper levels of the priesthood, and the senior government position as high-ranking servants and scribes. 
and somebody's car alarm is going off. You may want to hit the uh, thing on your remote. Is that a message? <laughs> Second, economic exploitation meant that two-thirds of the annual production of wealth ended up in the hands of the ruling elite through taxation of agricultural production and ownership of the land. The peasants lived an existence of unremitting labor, borderline nourishment, high infant mortality, and radically low life expectancy. And third, the political oppression resulted in the vast majority of people having no voice in the structuring of society. And fourth, Borg says, the religion of the elites affirmed that the structures of society were ordained by God, thus imposing on the whole thing a religious legitimation. But Jesus, when he's talking about the power that's in the kingdom, offers an alternative to this power-based uh, cultural and society. It's about compassion and justice. It's about living as if God reigns and living with love and compassion where it's like the last will be first. And choosing to confront the dominant culture, to confront suffering, confront pain by saying that it is important that we give our lives for one another. The path of Jesus or the way of the cross is a long conversation that's taken centuries to explore and will take centuries to continue to explore about how does God save us. There are several views of atonement <laughs> But one that is interesting is what's called the subjective view of how the cross saves us. And it originates, uh, or most scholars think it originates, with Peter Abelard. And Peter Abelard was the French theologian and poet of the 12th century, a contemporary of, of St. Anselm. And his view was a minority view through much of Christian history. However, in the recent climate, especially the political climate that we're seeing across Europe and in North America, that climate in which, um, in which we have an opportunity to talk about our views in a much fuller way, rather than putting up with the, the shenanigans that happens over very partisan politics or adversarial politics. And we, we know what's happening everywhere in terms of that expression of, of who we are and what truth is. And let's talk about Evelard then. The principal meaning of the cross and its moral impact, and that's from, uh, from Abelard. Christ's sacrifice on the cross demonstrates a complete self-giving love that inspires us to live likewise. Feminist and liber liberationist theo theo theologians have picked up aspects of Abelard's position by arguing that Jesus' radical ethic of inclusion called into question the impressive social hierarchy that maintained the privileged status of the religious and political authorities of this day. The cross should move us to resist moral oppression and injustice in all forms and to stand on the side of society's victims. And so when Jesus is confronted with James and John wanting a place of prominence, he tells them that they need to be baptized in the baptism that he is being baptized, to live into that newness of life. 
but he's also telling them in a very powerful way that they need to find ways to look after the least, to look after those who are on the margins, or on the fringes. The United Church of Christ in the United States has a, has a slogan in their program called Be the Church. And they proclaim the slogan, and it's very similar to what some of the others, but it's also so countercultural to the political reality in the South now and the political reality around the world. And they say, be the church, protect the environment, care for the poor, forgive often, reject racism, fight for the powerless, share earthly and spiritual resources, embrace diversity, love God, enjoy this life. And I think that is a good commentary on what we need to do to find our place in God's realm. And we're going to close with the singing of the hymn that I mentioned last week, um, a hymn that was written in such a way to talk about until we are able to do these things, then God will continue to weep and to cry but in there is hope that we can set before us in the way that we follow Jesus a way to be the church, to love God, to enjoy this life. So let's sing together this hymn. It's by Shirley, uh, it's up on the screen and you will find it in More Voices number 78. Thank you. 